Well, good morning. It's wonderful to have everybody here this morning. Uh, as usual, our kids are going to start us out the first Sunday of the month Daddy. with a couple of great kids' songs. We're excited. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's hear them. Very good, thank you. Because you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile, you gave me Jesus and you made me his child. Thanks, Lord. Amen. And so now we get to see a beautiful picture of that as we have a wonderful young lady who has become a child of God and is about to give us that testimony uh, through the picture of baptism.
I'm just continually praying that God will continue to awaken hearts. Well, this morning, uh, I told Lauren she will not forget this baptism because this baptistry water is a little chilly this morning. <laughs> but uh, I am so excited for this young lady. Uh, she is an inspiration uh, to all the girls in our, our small group, in our small groups her age, and in our, in our youth group and stuff. She's just a great inspiration. And, and a couple, last Sunday, she came forward and said, Ron, I want to come and be baptized. And I'm ready to uh, publicly tell my families and friends of what Christ has done in my life. And this baptism is a beautiful picture of what Christ has done in Lauren's life. That she is dying to herself. And this, when she comes out of the water, it's a representing of living a whole new lifestyle. Because now she has uh, Jesus Christ in her life. And today, Lauren, you're no longer just a student that's in my ministry now. But you are now one of my sisters in Christ. And because of that, and because of the authority that this church has given me, I baptize you this morning, Lauren, uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. worshiping in spirit and truth this morning, uh, hearing the children and seeing that beautiful testimony. Let's stand right now and welcome one another in the name of the Lord.
that you have given us both physically and spiritually. Father, may our heart's affection be set on you this morning. May our mind's attention be focused upon you, the most righteous, holy, awesome God. We love you. And we pray. You may be seated.
you're visiting with us here for the first time this morning, we're so glad to have you with us. There's a place in your bulletin that you can fill out some information and uh, put that in the offering plate at the end of the service. It's been a wonderful morning of worship, and uh, we anticipate greatly the word that the Lord has carefully prepared and Brother Ron. Uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. No other God really even exists. No authority is greater than yours, Lord Jesus Christ, the true King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator and the sustainer of all life and the savior of our souls. What an awesome privilege to be here this morning in your presence lifting our hearts in love and praise to you and worshiping together and loving you. Thank you so much for the privilege we have to be here this morning with you and with each other. And may you open our hearts and our minds now to receive with gladness the word that you have carefully prepared in Brother Ron this morning. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer because we know that when we ask for wisdom, you give it to us generously because you promise you will. We love you and we thank you for hearing us. It's in your amazing, accomplishing name that we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I want us to pick up kind of where we left off last week, and I want us to uh, go back to verse 19. And uh, in seminary, they teach us that context, context, context. So I want to keep all this in context. So let's, let's pick it back up in verse 19, and let's end it in verse 27 this morning. James chapter 1, verse 19 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to be anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Verse 26 says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you so much for this time of worship. And God, I just pray you be with me this morning, God, as you will just help me refresh the memory and the study of this week. And God, that your voice will be heard, that hearts will be broken, and that lives will be changed because of the Scriptures. God, may your name be glorified in this today, and may your name be made famous, and may lives be changed. And it's in your Son's name I pray. Amen. We're continuing this series called Transition. Transition, as the dictionary defines it again, as I've said each week, is a process or period in which something undergoes a change and passes from one state, stage, form, or activity to another. That's what a transition is. Now, the thing is, the reason I chose this title, Transition, is we as our church now is going through a major transitional movement or moment here. We are transitioning from one under-shepherd to a new under-shepherd. And as we are going through this process, I thought one of the best places to go during this moment, during this transition moment, is in the book of James. The reason why James is writing to a group of people who are going through some extreme transitions in their life. 
that's very difficult, it's very hard. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says he's writing to the dispersion. There is a group of people who are under extreme persecution. We think it happened right after Acts chapter 8, after the stoning of Stephen, that this uh, rage of persecution began to fall on the church of Jerusalem. And as they're going through these transitional moments, as they're losing their homes, losing their house, possibly even burying some loved ones, James, knowing their heart, loving them, writes this letter. And he writes this letter, and he always focuses on two things when you read this letter. He focuses on our faith in Christ and our obedience to continue to follow Him. Because like it or not, all of us, when we go through a transition moment, all of us have the tendency to quit putting our faith in Christ, quit being obedient to the Word, and we begin to turn to ourselves and try to fix it ourselves. So knowing that process, James writes this letter. In week one, we looked at two things. The first thing we looked at is he dealt with tribulations. Look at chapter one, uh, verse uh, verse one or chapter one, verse two. It says, "Count it all joy, my brothers, when meet when you meet trials of various kinds." And that first week we talked about trials that are going to come, and they're going to come in different ways. Some of them are going to be small. Some of them are going to be big, but he says, wherever, whatever one, which one ever comes, he says, make sure you count it all joy. Now, I don't know how many of you in this room, but there's not much joy when trials come. Not everyone's walking around with smiles on their faces saying, thank you, Jesus, for choosing me to go through this trial. No, but what we learned in week one is that we should count it joy because there is a sovereign God who is in control of all of our trials and he's using it to complete his will and his purpose in our life. And here were some things we were discovered. What is he building on us? Well, we discovered in week one that he wants us in verse four to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God says, I want you to become like me. I want you to be a resemblance of me. So I'm going to put you through trials. I'm going to put you through testing to mold you and to make you. Another thing we learned that if we're go, while we're going through these trials in verse five, he says, if you are lacking wisdom, he says, come to me, ask me and I will give you generously the things that you need to get through this trial. So that was something he wanted us to realize to become more like him, to depend on his wisdom. Uh, wisdom. We saw that we need to depend on his resources. And then we, re- we remember in week one, he said, also remember about the eternal award, that crown of life to keep on trucking, keep on going through these trials because there is a better life to come. So as I am molding you and making you and growing in your wisdom, I'm just getting ready for the afterlife. I'm just getting ready for the eternal life. I'm just getting ready for when you stand before me. And then in week one, he not only dealt with tribulations, but he dealt with temptations. All of us know that when we're going through tough times, temptations come, don't they? And James, knowing that, says, here's the first thing I want you to remember. Don't blame God on those temptations. Because God doesn't tempt. God doesn't sin. God doesn't tempt you. Notice what he says here in verse 15. Or verse 14 of chapter 1. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by whose desires? His own desires. And what we discovered is all of us have these sinful desires in us that draw us away sometimes if we allow it. Draw us away from God. And it says here that when we uh, are lured by it, when we are enticed by it, eventually, and we buy into it, it conceives and it bursts sin. And sin always leads to tragedy. He says, so watch out. Don't blame God for the temptations that come in your life. You're responsible for those. And then, last week, he dealt with the thing we called the Word. We dealt with the Word. And one thing we discovered last week was this. How a person reacts to the Word is evidence of his faith in God. How a person reacts to the word is evidence of his faith in God. And James' point last week was this. If there is no action, if there is no change when you read the word of God, he says you're not accepting it. Because when you dive into the word, when you read the word, it changes us. It changes our desires. It changes the way we think. Now, we don't become perfect by no means. 
We are not perfectionists at all after we study. We realize that we're imperfect. In other words, we see our sin, and when we see that sin, we don't continue to pursue that sin. We begin to hate that sin. Go with me to Romans chapter 7. Paul says the same thing here in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. I love what he says here. He is the, he's kind of given an example of his, human, or his humanist and his new nature. And notice what he says in verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. In other words, he says, I strive to do good, but there are still moments that I do the things I hate. But the thing I love about it, he says he hates it. He doesn't love it when he continues in that. He says, I hate it. He goes on in verse 17 and describes that there is sin that dwells within me. And then verse 18, he says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. And then he goes on, he says, For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And then he goes down to verse 19, he says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Paul says, I continually struggle with my sin. But here's the thing. He has a desire to change. And if you don't have a desire to change, you need to check yourself. You need to seek your heart out. There should be a desire to change. And not only that, I'll tell you someone else I don't like reading. Go to 1 John chapter 2. You don't like black and white. This is how it is. It's black and white here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And he says this, And by this, we know that we have come to know him if what? We keep his commandments. Verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly love the God or truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. So John says, I'll tell you how you if you know you love God. Are you obedient to him? Do you follow his commandments? Some tough stuff to swallow. But guys, listen, if you're not in the word, you're just deceiving yourself. If you're not in the word, you are simply deceiving yourself. That's why James tells them to be doers of the word, not just hearers. Because if you do, you're just deceiving yourself. So why? And last week we said, what are some things? How should we respond to this word? Well, James gave us three things real quick. First of all, he reminded us last week, we need to come to the word and receive receive it very humble. Look at verse 19 again. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Listen carefully, be quiet, and don't put your guard up. Verse 20, if you do, the angry for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And he says, if you come to the word and you've got your walls up, you've already got your thoughts made up, you've already got your mind made up. He says, you're just going to leave there angry and you're not ever going to perceive the righteousness of God in your life. You're going to be the same person you were when you came to the word. Then he goes on, he says, therefore, put away all your filthiness. You remember that word was to clean out all that wax in your ears so you can hear the word, remove all that immorality. And then he goes on and says, and that rapid wickedness, that deep sin that's in your heart that no one else knows, but boy, if we push those buttons right, all of a sudden we see that sin. He says, remove all that stuff in your life. And notice what he says, and receive with meekness, humbleness there, the implanted word. Why is that so important? Because it's able to save your soul. In other words, repent. Come to the word and repent because it's going to save your soul. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word. When you dive in the word, it reveals your sin in your life. And you should repent of it because it will save your soul. But if you come to the word and you ignore the word, listen, you're on your way to destruction. And then James tells us, don't just humbly receive it, but intently seek the word. Look at verse 25. But the one who looks into the Perfect law. That word look means to gaze upon, means to investigate, means to put your whole body into it. Study this word, memorize this word, know it. Why? Because it leads to the law of liberty, the law of freedom, and perseveres. In other words, when you buy into this, when you put your life into this, when you give your life to this word, you find freedom. Listen, 
Freedom is not going against the word of God. Freedom is found in the word of God. For some reason, we got that mixed up. We think that joy is outside the word of God. No, joy is when you live inside the word of God. There is joy when we follow the Bible and follow the ways of God. Listen, I know folks who've been in church all their lives. And all they do is been hearers for so many years. And they're the most miserable people. Why? Because they're just hearers. They're not doers. They're not intently studying it out. True believers look deeply into the Word and they linger there. True believers look into this Word and they linger there. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says this, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate it on it day and night, observe it to do all that is written therein. And when you, and when you will make your... And it says there, and then you will make your way, notice, prosperous, and then you will have good success. You want good success in your life? It's not gaining all the world's money. It's not having the best things. You know where success is found? Following the word of God. Following God's word. There's success. Now, when that word prosperity, I know a lot of guys want to get on TV and say, you got to do this, and if you'll do this, and you'll follow this way, God's going to give you a big house and a big boat and wonderful things. But that's such a lie. Prosperity and success in God's eyes is different than prosperity and success in the world's eyes. There is a total different uh, kingdom work there. Because if it's prosperity with big houses, that's, that's making you look good. But if it's about God, it makes him look good. Okay? So we need to learn to readjust our thinking on that. We need to get serious about the word of God. And last but not least, we said we need to obey it. Well, that's pretty obvious, ain't it? I mean, when God tells us what to do, we're supposed to obey it. When our parents, when I was growing up, I mean, I would have saved a lot of belts when I was younger. If I just obeyed it. I mean, that's based so much, I mean, I'm, I'm not being a father now. I'm just thinking, what are you thinking? Don't do that. That is not smart. And I know you're four years old and you got the world figured out, but don't do that. Just obey it. So the question I want to leave up to when we get into these next two verses is why is it so important to humble yourself? Why is it so important to be so intently about seeking the word of God? Why is it so important that we should apply it to our lives? Well, James is going to pull out three areas of why this is so important. Why we should really dive into God's word. Why we should get serious about memorizing the scripture, studying, finding time. Listen, you can read a lot and you can study a lot when you turn the TV off. You can learn a lot and you can study a lot when you turn the internet off. Because God gives us all 24 hours a day. And he hasn't changed. He gave Joshua that many times. He's gave Moses and Abraham. Everybody had 24 hours a day. Except some of them got to hold it back a little bit, you know. But uh, every one of us have 24 hours a day. And they studied the word. And those who bought into that, those who didn't buy into it, just believed it. And trusted it was successful and prosperous and learned what life was all about. So why should we find those moments? And here's why. First off, James says, here's why you should uh, uh, humbly accept it, intently seek it, and to apply it, simply because this. When you don't, you can be deceiving your heart. When you quit studying God's word, when you quit looking into it, when you don't ever take it and apply it, you can begin to deceive your own heart. Look with me in James chapter 1, verse 26. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious. So here's a guy who has opinion of himself, and he thinks he's a very religious man. And does not bridle his tongue, but sees his heart. This person's religion is worthless. In other words, what James is saying, when you don't humbly seek God's word, when you don't intently study it out, when you don't obey it, you can be living a deceitful religious lifestyle. Do you understand that? You can be deceiving yourself. And it's and he tells us it's worthless. You're wasting your time. Because he says, you know, 
get serious about God's word, because if you don't, you're deceiving your own heart. Listen, you can be biblically outside. You can do all the great things in church. You can come to church. You can wear the right clothes. You can have the right uh, language. You can, know, you can do all the churchy stuff. But just because you're doing that does not mean you're right in the eyes of God. You're deceiving yourself. And notice what he says. He says, anyone who thinks his religion is good, but he doesn't bridle his what? His tongue. Now, I was blown away when I was reading. I was like, why in the world would he use the word tongue? Because here's the thing. Your tongue will always reveal your heart. Your tongue always reveals your heart. Your tongue is an indicator of where your heart is. Your tongue, it says in the scriptures, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, when people come up to me and say something to me or say something about me and they go, I didn't mean to say that. I want to say, yes, you did. You certainly did. You can give me all these excuses you want, but you meant to say it or you wouldn't have said it. There's something wrong with your heart. It's not that you have a bad speaking problem. You just have a heart condition. And you need to have surgery on it a little bit. Because out of your heart, it speaks. Listen, the tongue is a very dangerous weapon. It's very scary to me. And James, I don't think we'll be able to get to chapter 3, but I just want to jump over there real quick. Let me just show you how bad this tongue is. Turn with me to James chapter 3, and I just want to show you what this tongue can do. Look at verse 6. And the tongue, it says, is a fire. Verse 6 of chapter 3, a tongue is a fire fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members. Notice, staining the whole body. Setting on fire the entire course of life. And set on fire by hell. Verse 7, for every kind of beast and birds and of reptiles and sea creatures can be tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But notice this, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we will bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we'll curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the mouth comes blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Wow. The number one weapon that has destroyed more churches is this thing in our stinking mouth. Our tongue. Our tongue has destroyed many lives. Our tongue has destroyed many churches. Our tongue has destroyed many marriages. Our tongue has destroyed many friendships. Our tongue has been the biggest weapon against the Lord's kingdom than any other weapon there is. And let's look at it again. Verse 26, he says, If anyone thinks he is religious, this is a first class conditional Sentence. You find first class conditional sentence all through uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In other words, it says, let's assume this guy is religious. He says he's religious. Well, let's consume that he is religious. And this is a guy who thinks he's a religious guy. In his mind, he's not a hypocrite. In his mind, he has it all together. In his mind, he is biblical. In his mind, he is complete. And, and, And only in his mind is he right with God. And he's done all the right church stuff. So in his mind, he is justified. He is right. He does not make mistakes in his own mind. This word religion is used in an adjective form here. It's the only place that it's used that way. These other times it mentions religion is in the noun form. So it's describing, here's a man who has in public worship here. He's in public worship. He's out in the crowd. He's in this church or in the church. And he's worshiping God. And he's doing all these great things. And notice what it says. But the way we know he's not religious and it's not right is because he says he can't control his tongue. Outward religion without God's inner control reveals that religion is worthless. Professing religion and having a tongue out of control is a great deception. Verse 26 says, and does not bridle his tongue. Notice what happens. But he's deceiving his heart. 
You know why it's so serious to dive into this right here? Because it purifies the heart. Why should you humbly seek this out? Why should you um, intently study this? Why should you obey it? Because it purifies the heart. And if the heart's pure, the mouth will be pure. You understand that? If your heart is made pure by studying and putting your faith and trust in Christ, then your mouth will be pure. A corrupt, unholy speech is made by a corrupt, unholy heart. Matthew 12, verse 34, Jesus said to these Pharisees, these religious people, you remember this? You brought of vipers. That's very encouraging, huh? I bet they were going, thank you, Lord. No, they were mad. He says, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Listen, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they talk. Now you say, well, I don't know. No, listen, if you hang out with people long enough, their true colors will come out. Listen, and the thing is, you're not going to quit talking. I read a statistic the other day that said one-fifth of your entire life you'll be spending talking. But guess what? You're going to be doing a lot of talking. And knowing that you're going to be doing a lot of talking, why not get in the Word so you'll have a pure mouth? Why not get observed in the Word? Why not be humbled by the Word? Why not be intense study with the Word? Why not obey the Word so when you speak, it's nothing but words of encouragement? Words of uplifting, words that expand the kingdom of God. And notice what James says. He says his mouth is totally out of control. And when it is totally out of control, he says his religion is worthless. Worthless means to accomplish nothing. It's a religion that doesn't transform the heart and it it accomplishes absolutely nothing. You're wasting your time. So he says this, humble yourself, intently study the word, obey the word so that you can begin to speak with proper words and that your heart can be transformed. So why is it important to receive it? Intently study it and obey it, number one, because you can be deceiving your heart. Number two, it can cause you to love other people. It can awaken your heart to love other people. Look with me next. Kind of a different transition here. Look at verse 27. A religion that is pure, that's clean, and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Do you get that? True religion, true worship is summarized in one word, love, love, compassion, pure religion, undefiled, unstained. The purest kind is resembled by love. Jesus looked at his disciples in John chapter 13 and said this, by this, they shall, this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that when you have loved one another. You know how we are different from everyone else as Christians? We should love one another. When people come in this church, they should see one of the most beautiful gospel presentations they've ever seen before. They should see a group of people who love one another. If we are called by God and we have put our faith and trust in Him and we are humbling ourselves to His Word, we're intently studying the Word, we're intently obeying the Word, there should be a great gospel presentation that any lost person that comes in here says, I don't know if I believe it, I don't know what's going on, but I want some of that. Because they love one another. People are looking to find people with love. And that should be the representative of us. Religion that is pure and undefiled is ones who love one another. And notice this, religion that is pure and undefiled before whom? Notice, God the Father. In God's evaluation, pure religion is when we begin to love one another. That's God's standard. You know why? Because the Bible says God is love. When you love one another, you're loving like God does. When you're loving one another, you are loving like God is. God says you are a genuinely religious in the truest sense of the word when your life is marked by obedience and when it's marked by love. He goes on, true religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father 
is to visit. Now, this word to visit means to, uh, has the idea of bringing love and bringing pity on someone else. It's what we find in, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 36. He says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The ideal here is reaching out in a loving, caring service. He says, if you want to show how much you love God, if you want to show how intense you've been in the word, it should lead you to love someone and not just go by and say, how you doing? No, you go by and you love them. You feed them. You clothe them. You minister to them. First John chapter 2, verse 10, 11 says, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In other words, a mark of a true believer should be one of love. You know, there's always ways we can test ourselves where we stand with God. And one of them is how do we love our neighbor. You remember the Good Samaritan story? When he talks about he had what? Compassion on this guy. And then the man asked him, he says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus went out and told this whole story. And he looks at the guy and he says, who was the neighbor of all those three? The priest, the Levite, and the good Samaritan. He wouldn't even say the Samaritan's name because he hated him. And he says, go and do likewise. In other words, you go serve people that you don't like. You go hang out with people you don't like. You go hang out with the one people group that you wouldn't want to be in your house. He says, if you're loving those people, then you're loving God. If you're loving the people that doesn't make you comfortable and makes you uncomfortable, he says, you're doing something that God did because he loved you when you were uncomfortable, when you made him uncomfortable. He loved you and he loved you so much he died for you. But he picks out two groups, though. It's pretty interesting. He picks out orphans and widows. You know, God has always been concerned with the fatherless and the widows. That's just his heart. Just follow with me real quick. Exodus 22, 22 says this. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Deuteronomy 14, 28, 29, every third year demanded a special 10% tithe to be collected from every Jew to care for the orphans and the widow. You find in Deuteronomy 24, 17, 22, they had a profit sharing plan for orphans and widows to be carried out for them in the harvest of all fields. And then in Deuteronomy 27, 19, I love this verse. Verse 19 says this, Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say amen. This is the heart of God. Psalm 68, 5 says, says, Father of the fatherless and protector of the widow is God and his holy ambition. God has a special desire for those who are in need, especially the widows and especially the orphans. And I want to tell you, I, I, I get moved when I see people in our church foster kids those who don't have fathers in their lives. And when I see when they have a new child come in, I'm a little hesitant to go up and talk to them because I always want to hear the story, but then I don't want to hear the story. Because when they tell me what they come out of, I have to walk away, act like I'm okay, and go to my office or to a bathroom and just start weeping because it tears my heart. And guys, listen, when you begin to study God's Word humbly, when you begin to intently study it out, it changes your heart and you have compassion for people that don't have a voice for themselves. You begin to have compassion for people who are not like everyone else. The fatherless, listen, we have kids on Wednesday nights that really are fatherless. I would say most of our kids that we have in our student ministry, there's a lot of them that don't have father figures in their lives. I have a young man that I invested my life into when I took him in my small group. He was in seventh grade and I had this whole group all the way to the senior but I had one boy in my group who his father left him when he was two years old. And man, my heart broke for him because he never got to understand what it was to have a father in his life. Now, he had many stepdads and stepfathers, but he never had a father who would love him and show him. And I try to stay in touch with him. I'll call him up and hear about what he's doing. But listen, there should be a compassion for those who don't have a voice for themselves. So when you intently study God, when you humble yourself, there should be a compassion to love others. And last but not least, he says here in verse, the last verse here, and to keep oneself unstained from the world, you should have a desire not to be stained by the world. That word uh, to keep oneself unstained is a present tense continuous verb, which means he continually 
strive not to be stained by the world. You know how he was able to do that? He humbled himself, he intently studied the word, and he obeyed it. Listen, when you get outside the word of God, sin will capture you. I mean, I I don't know anyone that's been captured by sin when they're in the word. But when you get outside the word, boy, it can take you and it'll take you on a ride you never expect. I got off the phone last night with a dear friend of mine. He was my best friend and, well, he was my best friend's buddy, uh, brother in high school. And I'm just sitting there talking to him and he's been through recovery and he's uh, really doing well. Man, just talking to him. I just got off the phone and I walked in my wife's, my wife was in the bedroom and I was like, that could have been me. That could have been me. I could have been going down that same road. I would have. And the thing is, here's a guy who was raised up in the same kind of family lifestyle that I was in. Here was a man who, who was a, one that went to church, knew all the things, and yet sin captured him and took him on a ride. Guys, listen, we've got to get in the Word so the, word will not stain, the world will not stain us. So as I end here tonight, maybe you're thinking, boy, I look at my life and I just want you to know, Brother Ron, there are times that my mouth slips. Should I be worried? Or Ron, there are times when I see someone in desperate need, instead of doing something about it, I just keep on going down the road and think nothing of it. Should I be worried? Or Ron, there are times that I get captivated by the world around me. Should I be worried? Here's the question I would ask you. If when you see yourself and you see your sin, if it doesn't change you and say, ah, but if it brings hatred and you say, I hate this, then you're okay, I think. If there's a passion to change, then that's okay. But if you just continue on and there's no change, you should be questioning yourself. You need to seek God's word. You need to seek where you stand with God. Because there should be a difference. Listen, when you study God's word, you don't see your perfection. You see your imperfections. When you study God's word, it shouldn't lead you to worry about your perfection, but it, it should lead you to fix your imperfection because you realize that you're not all together yet. And you need to strive to come more and more like Christ. Is the normal pattern of your life as you look at it at your own heart a tongue that speaks good things, pure things, upright things, honorable things, honest things, clean things, but every once in a while your flesh pops out every so often? Is your life a, a life where you see a need and you, get, you desire to help, but yet sometimes you avoid it? Do you have a concern to not be so sustained by the world? Listen, Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. But I want to tell you, 1 John tells us, though, if you have the Son of God, it should not, you should not have a desire to sin. There's a difference there. There should be a desire not to sin. So the bottom line this morning When you humbly accept God's word, when you intently look into God's word, and when you apply God's word, you discover God's eternal joy in His Son, Jesus Christ, and you discover God's loving heart. So why should you get in the word? Because joy is there. Because the heart of God is there. I tell you, one of my prayers has been, when I started going through James, is God... Please give this church a passion for your word. Get a passion for you. So when the next under shepherd steps into the pulpit, he will look out into the crowd and he will see a group of people who are ready to go to war and to make a difference in this community and to lift up the name of Jesus and expand his kingdom. But Lord, forgive us if we sit around and wait for the next guy to come in. Let's get serious now. Because if you make it difficult for the next under shepherd, man, Lord, forgive us. Let's get serious. Let's get ready to do something. Let's get ready to take this community over. Let's make this next man come in and be proud to serve a church that is on fire for God. Let's do this. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. I thank you so much for your grace and for your love and for the compassion that we find in your word. And God, just continue to be with our church. Continue to strengthen our church. Continue to convict us. Check our hearts. God, if there is someone in here who has been playing church, and God, their heart has been deceived, God, I just pray that you'll show them the truth. You'll show them the way. 
And God, I pray for those who have never accepted Christ as their Savior and they're here this morning. I just pray, God, that they'll come and they'll say, man, I'm ready to give up my old life and I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ so I can begin to really live. God, thank you again for your word. And God, thank you for James, who has punched me, destroyed me this week, and has made me search my own heart. And God, I just pray that this church will be ready and be consumed by your word in such a way that the movement of God begins. And when the next under-shepherd comes to, to serve over this flock that's been paid by the Son of Jesus, that he will see a group of sheep who has been chewing on the word, who's been studying the word, who's been intent by the word, who is ready to obey the word, and God, that he'll be able to come in, and God, there will be a huge movement that this church has never seen before. God, break our hearts that we may be consumed by you and your word. As we stand, as we get ready to sing, there's usually about two different groups here this morning. There's a group here, group A, who's never received Christ as their Savior. And maybe today you realize that you need a Savior in your life. You need to find joy in your life. I pray that today you'll come and you'll accept Christ as your personal Savior and that you will begin to live the life that God created you to live. And then there's group B over here. Maybe you've been in church all of your life. Maybe you, you know who Christ is your Savior. But you've been so distant. You've been so uh, out of his word. You've been out of the way of doing his work. And today you say, you know what? Today I want to get serious about God's word, God's word, God's kingdom. And I'm ready to break and let loose and see what God's going to do. Let me tell you, it's a scary thing when you get there. But boy, God, you will learn more about God when you finally surrender to his word. You will see God like you have never seen him before. But the problem for most of us is we say, yeah, I believe that, but I'm not going to do it yet because i got a career. i got this. Listen, when you surrender all, God's going to take you to areas you never expected to go. He's going to make you do things you never expected to do, but he leaves it up to you. Don't waste this life that God has given you this morning. Surrender it all as we sing.
morning's offering. Remember, there are two plates this morning. We have a red offering, which is our building fund offering, and then we have a regular offering, the green plate. Chad, would you bless this morning's offering? We have a few uh, announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, to all the Crossroads Church members, tonight we will have our monthly business meeting, our coffee and conference, and the uh, bulletin says here to bring co- uh, cookies to, uh, to this uh, business meeting tonight. Also, uh, King Club is in, invites all seniors 55 uh, and up to a potato bar lunch following the, uh, this morning's services, and after lunch, you will be going to the Royal Theater to see a a, a play being performed at 2 p.m. Uh, the pr- performance starts at 2 p.m. and the bus will be departing at 1:15. So if you would like to be a part of that, stick around and then go and watch a great play. And uh, that's all I know of this morning. And uh, I know uh, one request is uh, be in prayer for little Garrett Smith. He uh, he got put in the hospital this week. He's got pneumonia and bronchi- uh, bronchi- or bron- how you say it? Bronchitis. I couldn't even think of it. Mouth is dry, okay? <clears throat> so uh, be in prayer for him. I went and saw him yesterday, and he's doing, he's doing better, but be in lifting him up in prayers and everything. But I'm going to turn this over so, to uh, Brother Mark. Again this morning, let's stand and be dismissed as we sing all tonight. 